And this is, I guess, the firewall between the subconscious and the conscious mind. And basically what we do is this process called pacing and leading. And what we do is we bypass this critical factor. So we call it like a yes set. So if you're speaking to someone, you could say, OK, you're all here now. You're all sat in this room. You're all listening to me talking. And you're all breathing. And you're thinking, yes, yes, yes. Everything this guy is saying is absolutely true. Without a shadow of that, I know I'm breathing, I'm here. And what happens is that bypasses the critical factor because the mind sort of turns off. I'm not, I don't need to pay attention anymore because everything this guy is saying is true. So whatever else he tells me must be true. And this, what happens here, when you bypass the critical factor, that's when you can start injecting your courage into the subconscious mind because it becomes in a, like a mind, less mindful state. So what can we do to create this sort of buffer overflow of the mind? So we said, said before about this pattern interrupt where you know, someone comes to ask you a question and you just say something com completely shit that just makes no sense. And you've interrupted the pattern to create this opportunity to inject your code. Another way of doing it is our brain deals with information in pictures, sounds, smells, but mainly stories. That's why you know, things are passed down generations and generations in stories. So there's this whole concept of the brain just can't handle more than somewhere between five to seven things at once. So what we do is we just open loops. So we start telling people stories, but we don't finish them. And we just keep on going on from one to the other. And what happens, our brain is storing all this, all this information up, thinking, right, it needs to come to an end, but I need to keep it there for a minute. And then you sort of again you create this mindless state because so much stuff's going on your brain is just confused then you create these opportunities and again this is like I say this is this processing limit your brain just cannot handle things well the other way is you speak in ambiguous terms so things that you're not saying this is going to happen or this isn't going to happen and, and you're making the person's mind have to make their own decision up and it just creates this confusion state where people aren't really what, sure what's going on and they're all confused and you're pretty confused as well. And then you can use this opportunity then to make the suggestion or try and influence the person to do what you're asking. And like I said before, you're creating this yes set, so everything this guy is saying makes sense, so why would anything else, if he was, if he was to tell me I'm stuck here, why not? Everything else he said was true. And it, I know it sounds strange, but this is, it is really is this simple. When, when I was first learning it, it's like, well, this can't work, because where's the, where's the magic stuff? but it's just our brain is so susceptible. So one of the key things when you're trying to do this is reinforcement is really, really key. So like I said, it's pacing and leading things. So you, you know the path, you're leading them down it. And like I said, some people make really direct suggestions and some people are indirect. So some people will just say, you're going to sleep, you're going to be stuck there, you're going to do this. Or you can take the more ambiguous approach, which is what I prefer. So you're kind of going under the radar. Another really important thing is to share the experience. So if you're telling someone that they've forgotten something, live that experience. So like, you know, you've forgotten, you've forgotten what that was I was saying now? So your, your body signals and stuff, you're sharing the experience, you're going there first. Like I said, it's about making this leap. And also to share the perspective of the person you're trying to influence. So if you're, if you're explaining something to someone over there, don't just be looking at them and pointing. Be, be looking at it from their angle, so that way you're getting the same information they are, and you can customise what you're talking about to reflect it and be more influential. And like I said, the key to all these things is we're all playing our own game, and to, to manipulate people and suggest things and get them to support our perspective, we just need to get them to play our game at any level. So it is, like I said, as simple as someone standing straight as opposed to sat down or sitting down if they stood up. All these things just help us progress to what we're trying to achieve. Now, one thing um, people say about hypnosis is you can't make someone under hypnosis do something that they don't want to do. Okay. So, how can I influence someone with language if they don't want to let me in? If, they're, if, they're, if they know they're not supposed to let me in. So basically, you use commands to alter their reality. So like I said before, you can ask them, what would it take to make this happen? And then make that be their reality. So people give these clues away. So if, um, like when you're doing research, how can I get in? Oh, you need a badge. Okay. So 
you know what reality needs to happen for them. So just have a badge. It doesn't have to be the badge they're expecting, but it, it starts building up this yes set of the guy's got a badge, he's supposed to be here, say he's supposed to be here, he knows the information. So basically you're modifying the game we're playing. So their reality is, I wouldn't let that happen. Okay? Uh, and just get them to, to follow your process. And one of the interesting sort of things I've found is there's this process um, in like a hypnotic thing called truth and lies. So I've used this to get um, passwords from people. So you ask them with their password, you're going to say no. I'm not going to give you the password. But what you can do is you set up this, this set where you, you switch off. So I'm going to ask you to be the biggest liar in the world. So what size feet have you got? Size 12. Are you a man or a woman? I'm a woman. So you build up this set of you're telling the biggest lies and then when you alter that scenario to be a truth teller these things slip through, it's mindless so you ask the same set of questions and then you inject this random code at the end what is your password and the information just flows out because the brain has just switched off and this subconscious information is just flowing through so what can you do with hypnosis? so if you're not familiar with hypnosis there's all the different things that come out of it we call phenomena so what can you do? there's a little bit of something for everybody so you can give people amnesia so they forget what happened. You can make someone stiff. Uh, why might that be useful? So you could uh, do all sorts of interesting things. But uh, one of the examples here is um, in some of the stuff I've shown, uh, if you've seen the videos, is you know, sticking people somewhere or making so an instruction so you could inj have a, a set command that you know, given a certain type of language or suggestion, they would become stuck, they couldn't move. Making people do, like a lot of common hypnotists make people's arms lift, you know, without people realizing that's idiomotor, idiomotor stuff. We spoke about it before, anesthesia, you can make people so they're numb, they can't feel these things. Hallucinations. So, a bit like, if any of you guys are a fan of Doctor Who, you know he's got that sort of telepathy wallet thing where he just shows it to them and it is whatever they believe so you could show someone a badge and have them believe it was the badge that they're expecting to see even though it, it wasn't or, or not believing um, that you were there so it's crazy it sounds making yourself invisible to the person sounds crazy and I'm not, still not quite sure how it works and even when I do it I'm not convinced it's really working but you know you can make, it, you know, you can make things appear make things disappear this is more for therapy stuff about you know regressions of people uh, that have had problems in their childhood. Hopefully, a few of you know what this is. Anyone? Excellent. So you can make time distort time. So um, another th funny thing you see these guys walking around town advertising a shop. Those guys, it's a pretty boring job. So wouldn't it be cool if you were to hypnotise them so that they think that the 10 hours walking around with that piece of card was really 10 minutes? That'd be quite cool. And then, we all like zombies, so we could use um, post-hypnotic suggestion. So, so the way I look at this is, um, I'd obviously don't say, I'm not saying you're going to walk into, into a company and just walk up to the security guard and go, <coughs> sleep. So what you need to do is, you, you find, my approach is finding these people in their natural setting, bars and pubs, absolutely great. And then sort of my approach is to say to these people, I'm a performer, I'm going to show you a magic trick. And you do some magic and hypnosis, and then when you're hypnotizing them and they're having fun in the bar, you could give this post-hypnotic suggestion that um, next time I see you and say a word, you flip back to this state. So this is why cool. If you see um, like hypnotists on stage, a lot of them will do sort of pre-hypnosis. So like, unless you're really good, you, know, you don't just walk up to someone and say sleep and they just fall to the ground so you give this post hypnotic suggestion the next time I say sleep you will revert back to this state and you can use this and create your own sort of zombie army if you were to hypnotize everyone in the pub that works at this company and then but when you walk in everyone just falls back to this hypnotic state <laughs> okay. I've got some videos on um, YouTube and stuff if you're interested in seeing them just different weird things where people give me permission to post them of hand sticking, people forgetting their name and stuff and really I think if you watch these, what it, what the way I like to look at it is if I can make you forget your name something you've known since 
you know, you were two, perhaps. So if I can make you forget something you've known all your life, just why could I not have you do something completely different? Now, quickly to touch on mentalism. So why do I, why do I think mentalism is important? Everybody loves magic. Who doesn't like magic? Mm. <laughs> There's always one. Yeah. <laughs> So, so basically, what I, there's two reasons I did this. So, first of all, when I was doing the hypnosis and it wasn't working, you're like, oh shit, I look a right idiot. So, I learned some magic tricks so that what would happen is um, I'd get a card and I'd put it on the table and I'd ask them to put their hand on the table and I'd try and stick their hand to the table. And when it didn't work, they didn't really know I was doing hypnosis and I'd be like, it's really interesting. You've just actually been reading that card through the power of your hand. And then... You know, I'd tell them what a card it was and that sort of thing. So that's really where I got into it, is using it as a get-out. So having this backup plan. But if you think about it, magicians and illusionists, what are they doing? They're manipulating people all the time. They're changing what we perceive. So lots of their skills and the, and the mindset, the way they think, I think in security, especially in social engineering, we can learn a lot from their processes and methodology um, for how we can get people to do things that we you don't want and build these rapports so like cold reading if, I don't know if anyone's a fan of psychics but it's not my thing but they use um, in my mind cold reading so these ambiguous comments that would make sense to somebody and when you tell someone all these inner deep thoughts all of a sudden they want to share all their problems with you and you've built up this rapport and you can influence them and then this comes around again to this sort of mind control process and where you can use all these things using hypnotic language to make it seem like we're reading people's mind. And all these things are to confuse people, to build up rapport with them. And then if you've um, been entertaining someone in the pub all night with these strange magic tricks, if you then see them the next morning, they're like, ah, oh, he's the funny guy from the pub. And trust me, they just walk you on in. Because everyone does magic. So I quickly run out of time, but... The main thing for all these things is these things don't work the same way for absolutely everybody. We're all different. So we need to understand people's baseline. So some people visually see things or experience things you know, in a visual sense. Some people hear things. I hear dead people and I see dead people. And some people are more emotional. So really, whenever we're trying to manipulate people, we need to understand early on what, how these people work so we can adjust our attack to focus on whether they're more visual or not. So, really important, practice, practice, practice. So, go out in pubs, try these things, research it, try and get permission so you don't get in trouble. So I'm telling you, get permission, what you do, completely up to you. Don't worry about confidence, it doesn't really exist. It's just not about having fear. And the other thing that's really important, big pair of balls, brass balls, because you're going to look stupid. You're going to run into situations where you think, oh, shit, I shouldn't have been here. But really, just keep on pushing forward. These things are difficult. But the more you try, the more you learn. And difficult isn't impossible. So just keep on trying these things. And when they don't work, understand why they didn't work. And some of you might think, yeah, okay, I know all this stuff. Why is it important? Just the fact that you think you know all this stuff makes you more susceptible because you're just not mindful to what's going on. So you actually can be more suggestible. Now quickly, I think I've got five minutes left. Um, human exploitation is wrong, everyone tells me. You shouldn't be doing these things. So I say, well, I think it's okay to do these things if it's me or someone who's doing it for the right reasons. So ethically, I think it's like anything. A gun can be used to protect someone or it can be used to, to murder someone. I think this information is the same. We can use it to educate people, awareness. But obviously people can use it for, for bad things as well. So I think as long as your intent is right and the reason you're doing it is for the right reasons and if you've got any doubt that you don't do it, then you're doing things in an ethical manner. Protection is important. So I real quick say how you can protect yourself. So educate people, learn about these things, empower people to challenge, test these things and practice and just tell people about your experiences, what things did work, what things didn't work. And make it personal to someone because people react. We were talking about this a bit yesterday on the, the podcast that if you make this something personal to someone, then they're going to take it seriously. As it, if it's just all about someone else, we just don't care. And don't become a target. And this is an obvious one, I think, but don't go into the pubs 
and stuff with your work badges on.